Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. Today we are looking at Fuzz Plus, number three, from Audio Damage. This is a freebie. I was actually hoping to look at um, one of their payware things, but oddly enough, there is no demo for it, forcing me back onto the older free things. Let's take a quick listen. Drums. Affected. Clean. Processed. Most applications or intended expected applications for this were probably in terms of some drums and TB303 emulation. Now we will look at those, but we'll also look at some other options. Um, let's start with audio damage. As I said, I was actually hoping to look at Grind. Grind offers more types of distortion uh, and seeing it's actually new and a, and a fully supported product, I figured, well, that's probably the way to go. So was surprised that there was no demo version. Uh, there's demos of some things, but not of others. But I think they try to push people into free um, versions Okay, fair enough, their business. Um, I just don't believe that I am reviewing a, an entirely equal product. Um, but that was the choice they made. What they do encourage people towards uh, is their legacy, which are discontinued or have been upgraded to newer versions, free things. Uh, here, Fuzz Plus 3 distortion. It's a fuzz distortion, so it's not a broad kind of distortion. There are quite a lot of things that you can access through this thing of theirs, uh, and they are pretty popular products. Their common name that you will see people putting forward in the what's the best free this, that, and the other. Um, interestingly enough, full disclosure, I've never taken an audio damage product to a complete mix. Now, in fairness, I think it's because I didn't relate to them well enough to get them where sort of they want to go. In having spent some time with this, I've got a little bit more of an understanding of where they're coming from and what they're doing, but they're not 100% the first thing I'd grab for. However, this was part of why I was interested in looking at the... Um, at the paid product that says it offers a lot more things, but it does always suggest that it's going to be preferring to err on the heavy-handed side. It's the market that they aim for. I mean, look at their uh, their company name is Damage. <laughs> so I'm not much into Damage. I'm into, um, into being able to mold and sculpt sounds, not to brutalize them. So looking at the product, one of the first things you might notice is I've got steady sound sitting here. They are noisy. So let's go through the good and bad. The good, well, it's a fuzz type drive and it's probably not a bad fuzz type drive as these things go. Fuzz is probably the single most aggressive of the drives and before you go, well, that means it's the one I should start at. Yeah, guitarists start with overdrive then there's distortion, and then there's fuzz. Fuzz was very much the 60s style of distortion where you suddenly have guitars that were just bleh, uh, <laughs> including um, um, Merle Haggard's guitars that were prone to sounding like a cow. Uh, fuzz is an interesting one, but it goes straight to extreme overdrive, like extreme overdrive, which means that it is You've got to go very carefully with it if you are not looking to shred or brutalize your things. But in, as far as it delivers quite nicely, it does have this filter. Now this filter, I'll be honest, I don't know whether it's pre or post distortion, but it does help the sound. So good on it, it's there. And as such, this is free. There's a limit as to how much we could, should complain about free things, but bearing in mind, 
it's the only option I could try. I'm going to try and treat it as seriously as though it were payware because it is part of their business program. Therefore, the things that bother me. Sadly, it is only fuzz. Like I said, I wanted to see what they could do, what they were doing with softer kinds of drives. But I guess their company has always been focused on shredding kinds of drives, aggressive paint strippery sorts of sounds. And that's fine. That's their business. But that's part of what's kept me away from using their product a lot because the emphasis is on being heavy handed. Big frustration, um, as you'll no doubt see, with regards to levels in and out. There is no sense of controlling them, so you can dial in a patch and it go from an acceptable level to just a ridiculous level. Um, I know this is an older product, but it's been updated not so long ago because it's got modern features. So why that wasn't rolled in, I don't know. Maybe that's just part of the trade for going and buying the product. But it's hard to say how nicely that's implemented because I can't try it. Uh, and as you have seen, it has quite a noise flaw. As soon as you've got even a small amount of drive happening, it's going to create quite a noise flaw. Actually, let's see if it responds to, yes, it does respond to Control-Z, that's nice. Um, so you will most likely need to apply a gate and you will also be incredibly wise to have a limiter across your master outs. What we have, we have a device that specializes in fuzz. So if we've got nothing happening, there is still drive happening. Not only can you see that level out is not the same as level in, but you can tell that's just a little chewy right from the get-go. So you do need to be very aware of what levels you're feeding this. This is not kind. It's not really meant to be a kind device. Sorry, my camera is really titchy today. Uh, so if you are feeding it too much level on the front, you may be getting too much distortion before you've even gotten off the 0%. So everything set at nominal, means this device is still driving. That's okay. Generally, when you reach for something called fuzz, you are looking to brutalize. But in this case, I'm going to try and show you that somewhat softer usage. So the obvious would be to dial and distort. As you see, the levels do not match themselves and you instantly go to far too loud. As I've said over and over, one of the problems with that is that it's very easy to just go louder is better. So get your levels so that they sort of match and then switch in and out. And sometimes your levels really need to be perceptually matched, not literally matched. But what you will hear there, and this is what this kind of processing is used for and can be very good at, as long as you don't mind the trades, is that it's lifting a lot of the lower frequencies and putting things more into the mids. That makes stuff far, far easier to mix, far, far easier to mix. And we get a better punch, snap and sizzle. We can end up with too much sizzle, as you may well be noticing here, in which case we bring in our filter and possibly even the resonance, not that far, so that we've taken a drum kit which is occupying all territory in the known universe and narrowing down so that it's actually going to fit nicely in a mix rather than saying, oh, we need more but more bass than anybody's ever mixed before and more treble than anybody's ever mixed before so that we can make a cool mix. This is saying, no, we're smart. We know how this works. And narrowing it down so that your feature instruments, because drums should never really as a rule be feature instruments, have more space to work in. If you've got a bassy bass, then it can work in under those drums, which is going to make the bass feel bassier. The punch here people will take for being, oh, that's 
And if the base creeps in underneath, the base will be perceived to be basier. Remember, mixing's always all about contrast. Oh, look, there's this one. Oh, and this one's bigger. So, distortion is just how much we're transitioning into pretty hard clipping. As you will see, everything's turning into a kind of a square wave. We can then add, let's get this out of the way, in fold back. Appears not to do a lot. Until suddenly it really does. And then it just becomes <laughs> terrible problematic distortion, but it has its purposes. It's very subtle, but you will feel a little bit more sense of oomph or body with the, um, the feedback fold back. Um, so go carefully, but don't just automatically put it to unless you really plan to do that. So in many ways, you can add just a little bit of drive just to punch us up here. Flat, papery, good and punchy, rock and roll. And then adding a little bit of, it's actually making that, particularly the kick, seem punchier. Overall, everything seems punchier, but we don't want to overdo it because it just sounds distorted. Cool. Again, if those hi-hats are too bright, which they are likely to be, you're gonna go, oh, but they're the best thing ever now. Remember, it's not as, um, as mix engineers for us to mix everything up here and down here and ignore the middle. Largely, we're mixing into the middle, from the middle, and then there is air, which should look after itself, but we need to set it up to be able to look after itself, and sub bass, which again, should look after itself. Our job is to set it up to be able to look after itself. If we've got all this treble here, as soon as we introduce a vocal um, or some kind of melodic lead, saxophone, um, then we're going to have some conflict with getting that to work. So by rolling this off, we've suddenly got something which punches harder, it snaps and sizzles harder without actually being in the way. So in the mix, that's going to come up nicely, especially when you come to a master and you've got a vocal, a little bit of treble boost will bring everything up. The vocal will stay right in front and feel very glossy, shiny, cool, good. Uh, so it's more aggressive than I would normally do. But so long as you can take care, you can get really pretty usable results. Now let's move on. The next thing, or the th really, in my generation at least, the first thing that um, Faz was known for was guitars. Now this is a guitar synth, so in no way is it meant to sound like a real guitar. I am deliberately staying away from guitar emulators. <laughs> You can hear noise in there. Normally if I was looking for this kind of sound, then I would be looking for uh, an overdrive far more than any other kind of sounds. Plus, this is a synth, so there are particular decisions that don't carry to every style. How that is made up? If we've got an echo, let's pull everything out.
because this era of guitars, echoes were used, um, often tape echoes, uh, so um, Dave Gilmore and his tape echoes kind of thing. We've put in a little bit of drive. hear a fair bit of intermodulation noise there and that's because at the moment this guitar holds so on its own no real intermodulation but as soon as we put several different tones together they start to do this this is not aliasing this is just intermodulation distortion it comes from everywhere don't necessarily get rid of it. Some of it, the lower stuff, which is more audible, you'll often just use a, um, a high pass to just get rid of some of the on the bottom end. But I notice people trying to get rid of all of it, and that's part of why guitars don't sound as great on modern, modern recordings as they are prone to on 70s recordings, simply because they accepted that. The intermodulation distortion is part of what the guitarist was doing. They were aware of it, they were hearing it. So we've got a pretty bright sound. Let's go back and just mute that. Because it's raising the level up phenomenally, then we do get a lot of hiss and bleh, that's in there. Just inevitable because we are using, in many ways, the wrong tool for the job. But a lot of guitar sounds have a lot of high end filtering. So that's actually giving us the beginnings of, of a fairly workable, little aggressive, heavy blues kind of sound. Not, not sort of hard rock, but, but you know, a solid enough kind of a blues sound. We are not able to finish here though. Now I know most people will just straight reach for impulse responses of, this is the cabinet that you want, you run this IR and you'll be instantly <laughs> boring. Boring, boring, boring. It's a good way to make a song that people will tell you sounds perfect because it sounds like every other song that they're listening to, which means they've got no reason to remember it. You don't want to go there. That's why through the 60s, each guitarist was really looking to have a signature sound. Eddie Van Halen. Guess who sounds like Eddie Van Halen? Um, Eddie Van Halen. Uh, and while there are some wannabe guitarists who wanted to sound like Eddie Van Halen, it was not a good plan. If you lobbed up to uh, an audition uh, with a reasonable band, you know, let's say you lobbed up to, I don't know, Judas Priest. They seem to have problems with guitarists these days. And you're busy trying to sound like Eddie Van Halen. They're probably going to go, thank you. Don't call us. We'll call you. Um, OK, they may need a Tipton or a Downing kind of a player because, well, it's Priest. But you've got to be able to have your own sound. If you're looking to set up your own thing, you have to have your own sound. Now let's go hard. This is the serious end of town. So we've got our um, first, and now we've got a second start. So if we run one drive into another, we can start to get that really full on. Now this is a guitar synth and there is no single way to set up a guitar synth to cover palm mutes and leads and all of these things in, in one go. You need to have modulations set up or two or three 
versions of the same synth to actually get there. Sorry about this camera. Uh, so this isn't a perfect example, but it's not meant to be. But just you can hear how we're transforming our sound here. If we go back and turn this one off. It's good as fuzzes go, because remember they're brutal. But when you've got the both in, it's giving you that really brutal kind of sound because this is how guitarists with really heavy sounds work. They work in a couple of layers to get themselves there. Now, the other thing that we are missing, I'll just turn the, the heavy, heavy one off, are the things that make a guitar sound really kind of work. Something about a guitar is that if it's an acoustic guitar, it has a soundboard. Now that's a resonance, it's a resonator. Here I'm emulating a resonator in the simplest possible way, which is one very, very short delay. This is, I'm not quite sure the numbers would be, the whole thing is 25, so 12 and a half, so it's probably about five milliseconds. So it's kind of a flanger, only without any movement. We could even pull the dry out, in which case you need more feedback. But by combining the two, we end up with peaks and troughs in our frequency response. So now we start to have something that sounds like there's some kind of physical resonating device. If you have an electric guitar, you plug your perfectly clean Strat into your, uh, your Fender Sidekick. The guitar itself doesn't have a lot of resonance because it's, well, it's a brick. Uh, but the speaker and the cabinet create resonance. So the easiest, nicest way to start to emulate a cabinet is with some resonators. It requires a little bit more effort to get there, but you can set up a sound that you like that works for your piece rather than just going, oh, I'm going to have the formula of this because those prints don't work. They're like putting bunny ears on yourself on your Insta ham or Facebook camera. Uh, you just looks like somebody who's pasted bunny ears on themselves. The other thing is that cabinet speakers <laughs> are far from flat. They also tend to put spikes and dropouts in. That's essentially the same thing. So we're adding two layers of resonator. You may think that our sound is more pure this way, and it is. But we're not looking for pure, we're looking to add character. Brilliant. That's how this is done. So if we put back our... Now you'll notice for the moment that I'm putting the echo before the drive. That is the old school way of doing it. You'll find that from the 80s forward, there was more tendency to put the delays after. But you notice it doesn't quite sound the same. That's between the drive and the cabinet, or we can put the echo right on the end. But you notice we lose a lot of body. So we can do that. Now, if, you, if you're thinking, oh, what if we put in chorusing? Yes, we can definitely do that. That's just using a simple unison. Just be aware that the more you chorus on the way into drum life, particularly fuzz, the <laughs> more interesting it gets because we're making a more complex signal and the fuzz will grab onto that and well it'll but 
start with light, more overdrive kinds of settings. We get really beautiful sounds. So do not feel that you need to get the perfect guitar sound by going and getting some kind of package that's just chock full of formula. Here we'll give you this box with this picture of this famous device that you may not have heard of um, and, and all these impulse responses and then that's going to give you the perfect sound. When I work with guitars, I can't stand them. I just get rid of them because they don't give me a result that's going to sound amazing in the mix. And I know quite a few real working guitarists, not people in forums, real working guitarists are exactly the same. So they go back to old school gear um, or they learn the techniques that I have learned as well. So there's guitar, we'll mute that fella. And then we've got bass lines. Remember I said in many ways, this device was designed for this. I've got a slightly complex because we've got a pair of LFOs working the way here to make a movement. But Subtractor is quite well respected as a TB303 clone. Let's get that movement back. So that just emulates me twiddling my knobs. You can hear there's that little bit of zzz on top. That's because this is just driving already. If we wanted to sort of get rid of that, then we would have to turn that right down. But it's still driving. Everything that hits the front of a fuzz will just get pulled up and start to, well, get fuzzy. So a long way towards square wave. Brutalized into a pretty well on-off kind of square wave. And that ripping paper, teary sort of sound was very But if you want to still feel the movement of the knobs in any kind of subtlety, you do have to back off. Because as soon as you go to just Insta square waves, then of course there's no real movement in the sand because it's just, it's a square wave, doesn't matter what you feed it, it's going to square. So that gives you that sort of mixed dominating sand that you're looking for. This is a lot of what this device was designed to do originally. We will uh, mute that guy. And last, which most people won't even try with this, and I admit that fuzz and uh, string synths is questionable, but it does work. And in. Nice sand on its own, but it's kind of flat. It does have a couple of oscillators working away, doing their unique things, and it's also got chorus delay and some reverb on board already, which actually helps make the fuzz do the things we want it to do. Yeah, it's got more character now. How that comes out depends on what we're looking for. We do not want to work too hard here. When you first apply it, it's probably going to sound a bit nasty.
And then just through a combination of filters, if you want to emphasize this sort of thing. And then you filter resonance, what have you. If you're wanting all those highs still, But just do be aware that it will crunch a little on the way in and the way out. Because as soon as it hears any kind of sound, it's doing its best to turn it right up. And then as the sound is decaying, it's still doing its best to turn it right up. So you get what's called hysteriosis. It's not the fault of the plugin. It's just the inevitability of what we're doing. We're taking everything and we're trying to turn it up as far as we can go all the time, which means as it's getting to that point of like, no, I can't do this. Oh, yes, yeah, no, oh, no, I can't. Oh, yes, oh, no, I can't. It will be, which is that crunchy, lumpy thing that you hear at the end. Hysteriosis. But overall, as long as we're not handling too complex a signal, then we can actually really beef up our sound and make it beautiful. So our synth, which otherwise would sound quite flat and papery, now actually transitions to sounding more like a sample from I don't know, a, a Spitfire pack or something or other. So this is how we get some of that kind of cool stuff out of synths. We don't necessarily deny that it's a synth at all, but we think, how does the real world work? And so a concert hall actually has some of the features of a fuzz pedal. And once we record it, and add in the inevitable distortion from the mics and the pre's and what have you, especially if we've gone cool and uh, and gotten old tube mics and tube pre's and tube this, that and the other analog. We will get this sound. Which is that big, rich feeling of kind of being there in a hyper real superhero cartoony sort of a way. And... This is so much more engaging than this. Especially if we're holding a sound. The way they interact together becomes really gorgeous. So bottom line is that we can do an awful lot with a fuzz. Let's put our drum and we throw it together. Papery. Now it's sounding fairly good. I mean, obviously it's pointless, so I'm not going to say that's great. It's not, it's pointless. But even though this fuzz plus number three is heavy handed, with care of what you feed it in the front end and how you set it up, it's actually capable of doing some really rather nice work, but just be aware that you're probably going to need to put some kind of noise gate on this. This this thing needs nappies. It is noisy. So if we pulled in just our basic channel dynamics, let's make sure we're the only game in turn here. Yes, we are. We don't need the compressor, but our gate we need to set up to be able to handle what's going on here. And it sure doesn't seem to want to kill that fully. Oh, it's because there's the other one still in play. So we will 
find the point at which we start to be able to slay our signal. It's pretty low. It is pretty low. We don't have to go to nothing, but that will now handle things. We might even want to consider threshold and hold a little bit. So now it's not actually gating the, uh, the drums. But once they stop, our signal largely goes away. Limit, but most systems, most doors will come with a, uh, a workable gate. If not, go ahead and get one. You, you uh, sooner or later will need some kind of a gate or expander, which is just a uh, kind of an, an upside down compressor. And that's where you would then set your thresholds and rather than trying to gate your signal fully, you'll just turn it down. Which, if your gate is giving you a as your sound happens, not so good. Whereas an expander will turn our signal down enough probably not to be noticed and it'll ride with it a bit smoother. You've got to learn when one is better than the other. Initially, you might as well start with gates and then just look to either turn them off completely or do the same thing, which is just to allow a little bit there so you don't end up with this switching it on, switching it off kind of feel because it suddenly makes the noise very noticeable. Besides, a little bit of background noise in a mix actually can help it make sound really, really nice and organic. Bottom line, good device. The, uh, the Fuzz is actually a good device and a better device than I have given it credit for over the years. So slap on the wrist to Benedict. Um, but you do need to take care with it. Otherwise, it'll brutalize things because that's the nature of Fuzz. Um, yes, keep a good eye on your levels because if you are putting out a lot more than you're pulling in, then you're going to, uh, to think that you've made it better simply by making it louder. A, B, make sure that all things being equal, it does sound better. If not, go back, revise it. You can always turn the level up later, but at least have an understanding of, does it sound better because of the process or does it sound better just because I made it louder? In which case, you must well just make it louder in the first place. But be careful, don't mix because things sound loud. That's, that's not how mixing works. Remember, everything's relative to everything. So if you start with the loudest sound you can, you've got nowhere for the next sound, it's gonna sound small. And next thing you know, your whole mix sounds small because everything is just too loud. Um, limits, yes, we've got to watch our levels. We've got to consider having uh, some kind of uh, a gate. And as I've said, seeing it's a fuzz unit, we need to be a little cautious with what we're putting into this because it will always be heavy handed compared to say an overdrive or particularly a saturation. But most of what I'm showing you here are more on the saturation usage than drive with the exception of the heavier guitar sound. If you have any questions in general, please not about audio damage because that's I'm not support for them. Uh, if you have any questions in general, pop them down below, preferably ask a hitting, after hitting the subscribe button so that YouTube know that we're uh, adding value for your life uh, and ask a question. If it is a um, you know, question about your mix. If I can't hear your mix, I can't answer. That requires you to use OBS or something, not your telephone. Uh, use OBS or something to actually do a screen recording so that I can hear exactly what your sound card is hearing and see exactly what you're seeing. Uh, and that way I can give an answer. But please don't use me to mix by proxy because as a professional mix engineer, this is, this is what I do for a living. I'm always happy to give a, a little bit of assistance. I do a bit of pro bono work every single day because that's part of being a good professional. So try it, enjoy it, learn to understand the nature of the beast, and most importantly, have a good day.